Thanks for joining us for today's message. We encourage you to visit southernhillslv.com to watch or listen to past messages. We hope you enjoy today's message from God's Word. So Philippians chapter 2 is my text today. Philippians chapter 2, verses 19 through 30. That's what we're going to be learning about. Now, if you're new to the church, you picked a great day to be here because I'm smack dab in the middle of a new sermon series entitled The Happy Thief. We are studying through the book of Philippians this concept that joy, happiness, these are your natural inheritance from God. These are yours to be utilized on a daily basis. You should be living a life of joy. You should be living a life of happiness, especially if you're a follower of Jesus Christ because you are filled with the Spirit. One of the natural fruits of the Spirit is joy. It's yours. The problem is there are thieves, villains, robbers who are attempting to steal your joy on a daily basis. They're trying to take what is yours. And over these last four weeks, and in this 10-week sermon series, we're studying through the book of Philippians, and I am uncovering, and I'm unveiling, and we are searching out the 10 villains that steal joy from the life of a Christian. Today is number five. Number five, it's found in Philippians chapter two, verse 19 and following. We call him the friendship breaker. Say it with me, the friendship breaker. Some of you are new. You don't know we do this. You have to repeat after me. Otherwise, I don't preach a sermon. That's how it works. Here we go. The friendship breaker. Say it with me. The friendship breaker. The fifth villain robs you of joy by whispering into your ear. You can't trust anybody. We dropped off my son, Jonathan, 18 years old. 18, we drove all the way to Lynchburg, Virginia, or flew to Lynchburg, Virginia, dropped off my son, Jonathan, for college. And and moving into that town, I got to tell you, I mean, he knew absolutely nobody going to that college. This was different for me because when I was 18 and went to college, my brother had already gone, and several of the friends from our church and community and school had already gone away uh, to Florida where I was going to college. And so I knew a lot of the people there, and I already had somewhat of a community. But Jonathan went to college, and he knew nobody, nobody there at all in the entirety of the college. How many of you ever moved to a place where you did not know anybody before? Anybody like that? Some of you have, and that's really a brave thing. That's right, you're all from California. Welcome, all right, very good. (laughs) And it's a very brave thing to do. It's that feeling of being a 13-year-old middle schooler walking into middle school for the first time and wondering, where am I gonna set my tray and eat? It's the feeling that many felt when they came to high school for the first time, or maybe the way some people felt when they arrived at church for the first time. A nervousness and an uneasiness because I don't know these people and they don't know me. And so it was the case for Jonathan. So when he arrived there, he had no community. But we knew, my wife and I, knew a couple, a retired couple who were living in Lynchburg, Virginia. Their names are Francis and Linda Keaton, and they were members of our church. They sat here for many, many years, and they moved away to Lynchburg, Virginia. And when they moved there, they had no idea that our son Jonathan would be there one day. So we told him, Jonathan, look, we know you don't know anybody here, but here's what you need to know. No matter what happens, there are some people in this town you can trust. Their names are Francis and Linda Keaton. And, and here's the thing. If you need anything, go to them. If you, need, if, you're, if you need some food, go to their house. If you need to do your laundry, go to their house. If you need a place to stay at night, go to their house. Now, we never told Francis and Linda, but they're very close friends. <laughs> if you need anything, Jonathan, you can trust these people. You can trust them. The Apostle Paul was in a very similar situation in Philippians chapter two. He himself was in prison. And he was dear friends with the Philippian people. And the Philippian people had gone through a lot in their city, in their society, and in their church. And the Philippian people were not sure who they could trust. Paul had not only the Philippians who were his friends, he also had two other friends named Timothy and Epaphroditus. Timothy and Epaphroditus, two names that sound great together, and you can name your twins, Timothy and Epaphroditus. These two individuals were, were gonna go minister to the church at Philippi. And the apostle Paul was saying to them, look, You don't know each other, but I know both of you. And I want you to know each other and trust each other. 
That's the scenario of Philippians chapter two, verses 19 through 30. So Paul gives three reasons they can trust one another. Can I just give the main point of the sermon before I continue? Here it is. Do life with trustworthy people and you'll find joy. Do life with trustworthy people and you'll find joy. Like I said, joy is your natural inheritance. Happiness is what your life should be part of, should, should be in your life and overflowing from your life. But there is a thief called the friendship breaker and the friendship breaker comes and breaks down trust in relationships, in marriages, in father-son relationships, mother-daughter relationships, in friendships, in small groups, in communities, in your workplace, even in churches. And the friendship breaker attempts to break down trust and in doing so, you sap joy out of your life. And what I'm trying to say today from this passage is what Paul was saying to the Philippians. Do life with trustworthy people and you'll rediscover joy. The reason we have a trouble with this concept is because we live in a world that we've learned some very valuable lessons. Today I'm speaking to the heart of some of you who have learned some very valuable lessons. The longer you've lived, the more you've realized how few people you actually can trust. It's a broken world, therefore we live with broken people. And so you've come to a place where you can't trust very many. And so what you've done naturally is you've built walls around yourself emotionally and socially. It's not that you're a so, not sociable person. For some of us as outgoing individuals, we have a lot of people we call friends, but in reality, they are not very close friends because we have walls built up emotionally and socially. We only let people in so far because of something that happened when we were 16 or something that happened when we were 26 or something that happened even a few years ago. What I'm attempting to do is tell what Paul said to the Philippians, and that is this. I know you come from a rough place. It's called the world. But you've arrived at a new place. It's called the church. And the church is supposed to be a refuge from the world, a bubble, as it were, in a very, very dark culture, a light that shines differently than the way they shine. And now that you've arrived, if you're a new believer, in this new environment called the church, I want to encourage you to begin not only trusting God, but for some of you to break down your walls of mistrust and start trusting other people. So Philippians, meet Epaphroditus and Timothy. Timothy, Epaphroditus, meet meet the Philippians. You can trust each other. Francis, Linda, this is my son, Jonathan. Jonathan, this is Francis and Linda. You can, you can help each other. What are the qualities of the trustworthy pastor? What are the qualities of a trustworthy individual? Today, in this passage, we see three that I want to discover. The first quality we see is that of genuine care. Say that with me, genuine care. Say it again, say it again, genuine care. The first quality of someone you can trust is that they are an individual that genuinely cares about other people. Look what it says in verse 19. But I trust the Lord Jesus, again, this is Paul, talking about Timothy to the church at Philippi. He says, I trust the Lord Jesus to send unto you Timothy shortly, that I also may be encouraged when I know of your state. Hey, my my best friend here, my assistant pastor, Paul was an older pastor, Timothy was like his assistant. He said, I'm gonna send Timothy to you and I want you to know you can trust him and he's gonna find out about what's going on in your church and he's gonna come back and tell me. For I have no one like-minded who will sincerely, notice this, who will sincerely care for your state. Basically, Paul is saying, look, I know you don't know Tim, but Tim's the real deal. And when Tim comes down to help the church, you can trust, you can trust Timothy. He's the, he's the real deal. Y- you know the difference between somebody who genuinely, authentically cares about you and those who pretend to care? You know the difference? One of the individuals in our church that reminds me of this, I thank God for the men and women who serve in our deacon's ministry. For those of you who don't know, Pastor Armand, I'm not sure if he comes to this service or which one he comes to. Pastor Armand, oh, people are pointing. Oh, they're in the shadows. Pastor Armand likes to sit in the shadows because men love darkness rather than life because their deeds are evil. 
Pastor Armand and his wife Tess serve in our deacons ministry. People say, why do you call him Pastor Armand? Because he really genuinely has been a pastor in the past and shepherds and pastors many people in this congregation. He leads multiple, they, they lead multiple small groups and uh, live and serve in many, many ways here. There's many, many times that Pastor Armand will text me or message me on Facebook or call me and say, Pastor, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but so-and-so just lost their job. Will you add it to your prayer list? I'm not sure that you're aware of this, but so-and-so just lost a child. Can you pray for them? Pastor, I'm not sure you're aware of this, but this is what's going on with this person's job situation or their financial situation or pray for this grandchild who lives in the Philippines and pray for their situation. And all of this information, why? Because this man and his wife as shepherds in the community of Southern Hills are ministering in and to and among the people of Southern Hills. These are people who, listen to me, if you're a deacon especially, listen to this, if you're a small group leader, they authentically and genuinely care for people. Their heart is burdened when your heart is burdened. This is why I'm constantly encouraging church members to get into small groups with ministers like this, to get into community with other ministers. Why? Because in doing so, I, like Paul, am saying to your Timothys, these people are like-minded. They actually genuinely have a heart for God that bleeds out and cares for the people in this way. As our church continues to grow larger, one of my greater concerns is that there are individuals who will come into church, but they won't connect to people, which is part of what the Christian Christian faith is all about. It is not just simply coming in and singing songs to God, that's worship, or hearing the preacher preach, that is a study of the word of God, but community and knowing one another, being cared for and shepherded at this level. You can trust Timothy is what Paul is saying, verse 21. Paul has to explain why he's explaining this, verse 21. For all seek their own, not the things which are Christ Jesus. Paul says to the Philippians, you know the world as well as I do. Most people are all about seeking number one. Whatever I can do for me, that's how life is. And by the way, I know Las Vegas. I was born and raised here. And one of the things that is shocking to people who move here is that Las Vegas, outside of the ministry of the church, can be a dog-eat-dog, I'm here for me, I get what I need, I can't trust people around me type of a town. Now I gotta tell you, I, I constantly sing the virtues of this city where this city does well. I love this city for many reasons. One reason is they work hard, they hustle, they get it done. But if you're not careful, because a lot of us are not from here, we don't feel that our roots are here, so we come across people and it's all about using them and abusing them and throwing them away. Be very, very careful to begin to consider this, that that's the way the entire city is. That's not. This church is a safe haven from that. I say that because so many of us have lived long enough that we begin to realize or think that everyone is this way. Sometimes we have a difficult time believing people genuinely and authentically care because in the past we began to open up ourselves to individuals we probably shouldn't have. Have you ever been in this situation where you've trusted somebody you probably shouldn't have trusted? How many of you have made that mistake like Josh has? How many of you have done that? Raise your hand, yeah. You're like, I'm not raising my hand. I know where this is going, all right. Like, I don't trust you, pastor. Well, here's the mistake that many people make. They begin to place trust into people they call friends, but in reality, they're not really that close. Here's one of the reasons why. It's because in the English language, we really only use one word to describe almost all of our relationships. Friend, right? My friend is the person who sleeps beside me and I live my entire life with. But also my friend is that person I don't know on Facebook. We use the same word to describe all of our relationships. That's why it's important to understand the circles of friendship that I wrote about in my my recent book. The circles of friendship, when you begin to indulge information and give information to people outside of your closest circles of friendships, people will do some odd things with that information. Sometimes we express our emotions to people that are merely our acquaintances and we wonder why they respond so poorly. We do this on social media. We get on social media and we've got emotions that were very difficult for us to express to our best friend, but instead let's go to all of our hundreds of acquaintances and express that emotion. And this is why we have a difficult time trusting people because we don't understand with whom we can truly honestly be vulnerable about our deepest selves. 
Sometimes what we've done is we've put too much trust in people in the outer circles and not enough trust in the people in our inner circles. Genuine care. Anybody ever make these mistakes like I've made these mistakes? If that's you, say amen. Number one, to find people that you can genuinely understand a true trust with. We need to find the qualities of somebody you can trust. Number one, genuine care. Number two, proven character. Say the second one with me. Proven character. Come on, come on, say it again. Proven character. They not only authentically and genuinely care, they have a proven character in their life. Look at what it says in verse 22. But you know his proven character. Paul is still talking about Timothy to the Philippians. He said, guys, you know about Timothy's reputation, character, proven character, his reputation, that he is a son, as a son is with a father, he served with me in the gospel. See, Paul went around all around the known world preaching the gospel of Jesus and his little pal Timothy, who was his assistant, went with him everywhere. They said, you don't know him personally, but you do know of his reputation and he has a proven He has a proven character. Why do the Philippians need to know this? Here's why. Because the Philippians had been hurt over and over by individuals, so they lacked trust. They were experiencing post-traumatic issues. And what Paul was saying is, hey, you can trust this guy. Listen to me. In the same way, I, as your pastor, am coming to you saying, I know you can't trust everybody in the world, but there are people you can trust trust. Look for people of proven character. Verse 23, therefore I hope to send unto him unto you at once as soon as I see how it goes with me. Remember, Paul is in prison and he says, I'm planning on sending Timothy, who's helping me, to come see the church. And when he comes, trust him and take care of him. I've got to see how this prison situation is going to work out for me. Verse 24, but I trust in the Lord that I myself shall also come shortly. In the meantime, trust Timothy. Here's what I would say, practical application for you. Trust the people of your church. Trust the deacons in this church. Trust the shepherds, the pastors, the men and women who lead in this church. Trust them. I'm putting my reputation on the line. I'm putting the very name of Jesus Christ, as I'm supposed to, on the line to say that there are leaders and community leaders within this congregation to whom you can trust just in the same way Paul told Timothy you can uh, Paul told the Philippians you can trust you can trust Timothy look at what it says in verse 25 yet I considered it necessary to send unto you Epaphroditus here's where the second person comes in Paul is with Timothy and he's about to send Timothy but now Paul has already sent Epaphroditus Epaphroditus is taking the letter of the Philippians to the Philippians and he had already come from the Philippians here's this guy Epaphroditus say Epaphroditus I know you want to (laughs) close say it one more time Epaphroditus okay you speak Greek now very good this is good I'm sending unto you, uh, I, yet I considered it necessary to send unto you Epaphroditus. Now notice how he qualifies him. Notice the proving character. Notice how he references him. He calls him my brother, my fellow worker, my fellow soldier, but your messenger and the one who ministered to my need. It, it reads like a Yelp review, doesn't it? Paul is like, you can trust this guy. He's my brother and he's my fellow surger and he's my minister and he loves Jesus. He's fantastic, five stars. How many of you, by the way, are like me? You Yelp everything. How many of you Yelp? Some of you Yelp church before you came here. You know what I mean? I, my wife and I, we Yelp every time we go to a restaurant. We will not go to a restaurant unless we've Yelped it. And we like it. You say, well, didn't somebody tell you that was a good restaurant? Yes, Yelp did. I like to go to Yelp. And I like to check. And if it has under three stars, I'm not going. I don't care. What I want, by the way, if you go to a Yelp, you ever go to, how many of you do Yelp like I do? Okay, you, you Yelp, right? And when you go to Yelp, and if it's got four or five stars, fantastic. Great, go there. Other than that, it's not worth it. And here's the thing, here's the thing. Now, if it's got five stars, but it's only with five reviews, don't trust it. That's that dude's five best friends. That's it. It doesn't work. It has to have like a hundred reviews and then, then it's all four and a half, five stars. Maybe, you know, there's one bad review, one star and it's like, the waitress was angry. And you're like, yeah, whatever. You're just an angry person. And, and you're like, it's still a good restaurant, right? Here, here's what you need to understand. 
Who you can trust works very similarly. Proving character. Who is it in their life that shows a lifestyle of being around people who trust them? Or who is it in life that has left a wake of individuals behind them that are just dying and falling apart? A proving character is what Paul is addressing here and we ourselves need to have the same mindset. Look at what goes on in verse 26. Since he was longing for you all, he's saying, look, Epaphroditus is such a good dude. He was longing to see you all. He was caring for you all and was distressed because he had heard, he, because you had heard that he was sick. You say, wait a second, what? Epaphroditus was sick? Oh, yes, he was, which leads to the third quality of somebody you can trust. Number one, genuine care. Number two, proven character. Number three, selfless love. Say selfless love. Selfless love. Come on, folks, let's say it together. Selfless love. The third quality of someone you can trust is somebody who cares more about you than they care about themselves. Not always, but has a genuine lifestyle of giving of themselves for you. The way Paul explains that you can trust Epaphroditus is how the illustration goes out that that Epaphroditus was actually sick, but even through his sickness, he continued to care for the church. Look at what it says in verse 27. For indeed, he was sick almost to death. Now, we don't know exactly what his sickness was, but we do know it was very serious. And Paul said, everybody's heard about the fact that this guy was sick. I don't know how everybody heard about it. There was no social media back then. There was no internet back then. There was no television back then. But somehow, the Christian church around that world, part of the world, had heard that Epaphroditus was sick almost to the point of death. And it says, but God had mercy on him. And not only on him, but also me also, lest I should sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I sent him the more eagerly. I sent him unto you. Why did I send him to you? That when you see him again, you may rejoice. And I may be less sorrowful. I wanted Epaphroditus to bring you this letter. Why? Why? So that you could have joy and see that there are people you can trust. Receive him, therefore, in the Lord with all gladness and hold such men in high esteem. Hey, take care of these kind of men and women who are genuinely there, selflessly loving others. Look at verse 30. It blows me away. Because for the work of Christ, Epaphroditus came close to death, not regarding his own life. In the middle of working through the ministry, Epaphroditus kept working for God, even to the point where it was going to cost him his life not regarding his own life, to supply what was lacking on your service toward me. He kept ministering even though he was sick. And by the way, let me tell you about the pastors of this church. I'm talking about all the people that work with me. They're amazing. They keep working. Uh, they're willing to keep working even when they're sick. And I tell them, that's great, but please don't come to church if you're coughing. Can I get an amen, right? Amen, all right working all the way through. And that's the way a good minister is and working to this point. Now listen, you say, Pastor Josh, what exactly did Epaphroditus do? Epaphroditus left Philippi and walked all the way to Rome to take care of Paul for the ministry. You say, how long of a walk is that? Well, they didn't have cars back then. He came from Italy. They didn't have any Vespas. You know what I'm talking about? You say, what did they have? He had two feet. He walked 213 hours to come and take care of Paul. And in doing so, made himself sick. And then when Paul said, hey, go back from Rome to Philippi in Greece and, and walk back, he took the letter and walked all the way back. Why? Here's why. Selfless love. This is the quality of somebody you can trust. Now, as we close out the service, I've got three questions and one story. Say three questions and one story. Three questions and one story. Here are the three questions I want you to ask and we're gonna get out of here, okay? Here it is. Question number one, question number one. Do the people around you have these qualities? Listen, listen. Do the people around you have these qualities? Genuine care, proven character, and selfless love. You say, Pastor, I don't, I'm not sure that they do. For some of you, for some of you, you may need to start cutting some people out of your life that don't need to be there. They're toxic. Now, I'm not saying they're toxic to God because God deals with all people and loves all people. I'm saying they're toxic to you. 
I'm not saying they're toxic to everybody. There's some people who are, who are built differently who might be able to minister to them and care for them. But in your life, you need people around you you can trust. And I'm concerned for some of you as a shepherd is concerned for his flock, as a pastor is concerned for his sheep. I'm concerned for you. And I express this concern from the Lord. Do the people around you have these qualities? Some of us have had not a problem cutting those people out of your life and that's been, that's been difficult, but it's done. Now the problem is you've cut people out, but now you've built walls and you can't let people in. See, that's the conundrum. You, you have to trust people, but you can't trust people until you get to know people. And you can't get to know people until you can trust people. And you can't trust people until you get to know people and you can't get to know people until you trust people and you can't trust people until you get to know people. And so you're stuck in this cycle of keeping people at bay. And what I'm saying is the cycle can change for you. And here's why it can change. Because it works different in here than it does out there. Because those southern hills or any good church is not perfect, we honestly, genuinely, truly are trying to follow Jesus. And though we make mistakes, we live our lives under this principle of genuine care, proving character, and selfless love as best we possibly can. So the first question I want you to ask yourself is, do the people around me have these qualities? Number two, here's the second question. Here's the second question. Do I have these qualities? I want us to ask that second question to ourselves. Do I have these qualities? Say it with me, say it with me. Do I have these qualities? Some of you said, do you have, no, this is about you and me. Do I have these qualities? It's time for self-evaluation, you know what I mean? Please don't be like that couple who comes in for marriage counseling who is constantly sitting there thinking, man, I gotta tell you, when he takes care of his issues, everything will be perfect. And he's thinking, if she takes care of her issues, everything will be taken care of. And they're so concerned about the other person's issues. And the reality is if they would just both focus on their own issue, they together would be fine. And I know we do this when it comes to relationships and friendship and trust. You say, my problem is there's nobody in life I can trust. That's fine. I believe I can introduce you to people that you can trust. I want you to ask the question, can they trust you? Do you genuinely care for people, proven character, selfless love? If you have these qualities, I, I wanna practically point you to, to an article that my wife recently wrote. It's actually on Facebook, it's under my, you can go to my account and see it, I put it out there today for reference. It talks about, especially for w women and women friendships, it talks about how you can develop the right type of friendships. And she gives five really practical things. They all begin with the letter S. She says, the first thing you can do is show up. Do you know the reason why some of us long for friendships but never will have them? It's because we isolate instead of show up. Show up to church, show up to events, show up to community, show up to small, show up, like be there. You can't be friends with somebody if you're always not there. And then when you are there, you're kind of hunkered in the back waiting for somebody to break through. Like, hello! There's only one Peter Schutzman in every church, you know what I mean? Like you gotta... Doesn't work that way. Show up. Number two, number two, she says, serve often. One of the best ways to develop true friendship is to serve God along with other people. That's why I've got hundreds of volunteers for Kids Fest out there. They're having a great time. And we're praying, I'm praying as their pastor, that genuine friendships would be made as people serve with each other. This is why whenever I get up as a pastor, I'm like, hey, everybody sign up to help for this big event. I don't just care about the big event. I genuinely care about connecting you in relationship with some other people. Show up, serve often. Oh, I like this third one. She says, smile more. Do you know one of the reasons why some people don't have friends? It's because they scare people with their face. You know what I mean? Like their face scares people. And it's not because you're not attractive. You're an incredibly attractive person. If you would smile, it scares people. You know what I mean? You sit there and you just, you, you, what, what's going on inside is you're nervous. You're anxious. And your nervousness and anxiousness is not showing as nervousness and anxiousness. anxiousness. It's showing as anger and being put off by people. And so just a smile. 
That's okay. I'm talking to both men and women. Call me sexist if you want. Number three, smile more. Number four, say something nice. Sometimes we just, (laughs) some of us are gifted with a quick wit and sarcasm and it gets us into trouble. Anybody like that? Anybody? And instead of valuing quick wit and sarcasm, maybe you need to stop yourself and say something nice to somebody. Can I get an amen right there? You're like, man, I'm really smart. I'm all alone, but I'm really smart. (laughs) Here's the other one she said. Lastly, share something real. When the relationship starts to become actual friendship, then be honest and authentic about who you are and what's going on in your life. Like, get real with them. Now, a warning for those of you who get real too quickly. You freak people out. You know what I mean? Like, in the first moment you meet them, you're like, let me tell you about my broken toe. No, like, nobody wants to see that. You know what I mean? It's fine. You'll be okay. But here are some steps, practically. And so these are the questions I want you to ask yourself. I told you three and then a story. The first question is, do the people around me have these qualities? Do I have these qualities? Here's the third question. Here it is. Is there anyone who has ever lived who exemplifies all three of these qualities? Can you think of anybody who has ever lived who exemplified all three of these qualities? Genuine care, proving character, selfless love, always was all three of these. Can you think of anybody like that? If you can, say his name. Jesus. That's why Paul begins this entire passage in Philippians chapter two and verse 19. He says, but I trust the Lord Jesus in everything. He actually says it twice in this passage. He trusts Christ. This is my thought for you before you go. If you're here and you do not know Jesus Christ as your savior, please hear me. I know it's hard to believe you can trust anybody. And it might be very difficult for you to believe that because you've never met the very son of God, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ who left heaven to come to earth to die upon the cross for your sins and my sins. He lived a perfect life, never hurting anyone, only caring about others. And then they killed him, but he died not just in vain. He died to pay for the sins of mankind, including yours. And then he rose from the grave proving that he was the very son of God. And now he offers salvation to every single person. Here's all you have to do. All you have to do is put down your defenses and trust him for salvation. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. And this is how Christianity works. Once you learn to trust him, you're invited into this bubble of people you're supposed to be able to trust, his family. And it's a, listen, it's a really great way to live, it really is. I told you I'd end with a story. I absolutely love Asian cuisine. I, I, I do. Anybody else? Anybody love Asian? Raise your hand. Anybody love Asian? I love Asian cuisines. All of it. I love it all. I love it. I love ramen. Come from China. Oh, I love it. I thought it was Japanese. It's not. It came from China through Japan to me. To me, I love ramen. <laughs> Anybody been to Jinya down the road? That place is, um, I love Jinya ramen. I love, I love Chinese. I love, I love Japanese sushi. Any sushi fans? You know, first told about sushi, I'm like, it's raw? No, there's no way. And then you eat it and you're like, oh, this is good. (laughs) Thank God for sushi. I love sushi. I love Korean. Oh, I love Korean barbecue. Anybody go Korean barbecue? You go to the Korean barbecue place where they put the little fire in the middle of the thing and you get to make your own food. I'm like, it's amazing. And they're making you cook it, which is even more, I'm like, way to go. (laughs) Like, this is a great business model. Man, I love it. I love Vietnamese pho. I found out it's pho, not pho. I love, have you been to Annie Pho over here on Rainbow? So good. I was just thinking about it. It's really good. (laughs) It's really good. Or Filipino food. Anybody love Filipino food? I love me some Filipino food. We have so many Filipino people who go to my, our church and um, I'm, I've been adopted. They say, I am Filipino too. I eat so much Filipino food. I go to all the parties. I love the lumpia. I love the sour soup. What's the sour soup called? What's it called? Sinagon. Oh, oh, oh my word. It's so good. I, it's called balut, my friend. Are, are you referring to balut? I've had balut, yes. Do I like it? Of course I don't. (laughs) 
Most Filipinos don't. I think you have to be of a certain age to like it. I think that's how it works. You turn 55 and you're like, it's not that bad. And then you're like, because your taste buds are done, you know. It's, I love all Asian cuisine, I do. I really love it. I, I wasn't always the case. There was about a decade of my life, like 10 years, I could not eat Asian food, like at all. It was because of a traumatic experience. I was 12 years old, I was with my family, and we had stopped by for the um, not very occasional uh, takeout for us. This was a special occasion. We got a bunch of Chinese food, took it home, and uh, we opened up the little, you know, the little, the little boxes, and, and everybody's sitting there ready to eat, and everybody's eating, and all of a sudden, in the middle of the meal, having a good time eating, having a celebration, and all of a sudden, my mother screams, steads up, and takes a napkin and puts it down like this. And we're all sitting there like, what is happening? And we looked down in her plate, and there, wriggling, was a half-eaten cockroach. All seven of us stood up, backed out. What are we going to do? 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 We're never going to eat Asian food for a decade, for one decade. <laughs> Ten years. Do you know why? Here's why. Because I falsely associated a bad restaurant experience with all Asian cuisine. Let me say that again. I falsely associated a bad Asian, Asian restaurant with all Asian cuisine. And then, in turn, I missed out on a decade of great delicacies that our city had to offer. This is what we do to ourselves. You had a bad friendship experience, and so that bad friendship experience has affected all of the friendships you've had for a decade. It's not friendship that's bad, friend. We do this with marriage. We have a bad marriage experience, and now we assume all marriage is bad and terrible and villainous. It wasn't, it wasn't marriage, friend. It was that relationship. We have a bad small group experience. We have a bad church experience and we associate a bad church experience with all churches. We associate a bad religious experience with all religions and we deprive ourselves of the great joys that our city and our world have to offer. Friendship. Here's what I'm saying. Here's what I'm saying. I know to some degree or another you have been hurt. And I'm over here like Paul saying, I, I get it. I'm tell but I think you can trust Timothy and Epaphroditus as you trust the Lord. Don't let this villain break your friendships and steal your joy. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the passage and how much it teaches us, even about life today. And I do pray that you would help my brothers and sisters in this room, those Christians who have believed and follow you, I pray that we would genuinely build the strongest relationships among ourselves. I, I do pray that you would help us to surround ourselves with people with these qualities. I pray that we would be these qualities. And then I also pray specifically for my friends in this room who don't know you as a Christian yet. They've never been born again. I pray that today they would trust you for their salvation. They today would repent and receive you even today and see that you're the great friend. In Jesus' name we pray. If God has used this message to impact your life, we would love to hear from you. Please send an email to connectdesk at southernhillslv.com. If you would like to support this ministry financially, you can do so at southernhillslv.com slash give. We are always encouraged to hear how God is using this church in Las Vegas to reach God's people around the world.